Hello, everyone. Uh, it's our pleasure to have like uh, Shifan here to uh, talk about his work on like system architecture for quantum random access memory. I think like this is an important talk for everyone, like who working in QML or even beyond QML, uh, to understand uh, the pros and cons or like what is the challenges of realizing like quantum random access memory. Um, and I think that Shifan will be able to tell us more about it. And Shifan, the floor is, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, so first of all, thanks for inviting me here. I'm very glad to uh, chat with your guys about my research today. Uh, so today we will uh, go into a topic which is called Systems Architecture for Quantum Random Access Memory. Uh, okay, so I think classical random access memory should be very familiar to everyone. It's already um, extensively studied over the past years. However, the quantum version has been largely neglected for the past years. So today, this talk will show you like how to design the architecture for quantum random access memory. So just call it QRAM. Um, and I will show you how this architecture design sort of can influence the performance of the QRAM. And definitely, what's the relationship with this QRAM and QML? Because this is a QML seminar. OK. Mm. Oh. So let's start. Uh, before we talk about the architecture, I think uh, we first should need to understand what's the function of the QRAM. So it's like the question, why do we need a QRAM? All right, uh, so any of you, if I have some uh, questions, please uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. Okay, uh, so the first question we need to solve is why do we need a QRAM? So that's actually our motivation. So today, numerous quantum algorithms use a functional unit, which is called quantum oracle. I think that should be familiar with people who are doing uh, research in regard with the QML, because this quantum oracle is frequently used in a lot of QML algorithms. For example, here I show a Grover's algorithm and the Grover's oracle in figure one and this oracle uf implements the function that it takes a uniform superposition of all the possible addresses and returns zero or one for different addresses. So here addresses actually means the input to the oracle. So for example, in Grover's algorithm, the addresses are actually a uniform superposition of all the input qubits. Now, specifically saying uh, it will provide one in this Grover case if the address is the same as the address you want to search for. For example, x equal omega here and zero for the other cases. So some people may ask the question, what's the difference between the classical oracle and the quantum version here? Because you can imagine that you can always send some address, some addresses into the classical RAM, and it will also tell you the corresponding data. So what's the difference between these two? So my answer actually is, though a classical Oracle or classical RAM can also do this, but it has to check the addresses one by one, which means actually the RAM can um, deal with your queries or just like process the addresses one by one. But quantum actually takes power of the parallelism or superposition. So more generally saying this quantum oracle OD here actually can take a superposition of different addresses in the corresponding data. So look at the first uh, bracket here. You have this alpha i as coefficients before the address and with a zero attached to it. However, after this oracle, it will return you a superposition of this, all of these addresses attached with the corresponding data fi. So I think that's the power of quantum oracle. So why this quantum oracle is so important for QML, I think because you can understand it as a powerful 
data processing unit. So for example, you have to process a lot of data in machine learning problems. Now you have a powerful tool to process this data in parallelism because you allow superposition of all the possible addresses. Okay, so then we understand the importance of the oracle. The next step is to ask how can we implement such an oracle? It's like how to build a classical RAM. So actually QRAM is such a architecture that is promising to implement any arbitrary quantum oracle. And we first introduce a naive way to implement the oracle that is so-called sequential query circuit. And the sequential query circuit shown in figure C here use a functional unit called multi-control X gate. It's actually easy to understand this multi-control X gate. Uh, for example, here, the function in the figure B shows you how to select 0, 1, 0 address from the, all the quantum addresses because this circle control, dot control, and circle control correspond to the classical data 0, 1, 0. So if you apply this gate uh, to a quantum circuit, actually you select the 0, 1, 0 components of the, all the superpositions from all of these superpositions and apply a target gate uh, and apply the X gate on the target qubit. So this is sort of like uh, select one of the addresses from the entire sp space of the address. So this multi-control X gate can only activate a single address each time. But look at the figure C here. It allows you to query the entire address space. However, it's one by one because you use sequential multiple control X gate, just like the classical RAM does. Um, so let's look into uh, the sequential query circuit. Now the circle control means the zero control and the dot control means one. So you can see each gate actually correspond to a single classical address here. This is, this is an example of three address qubits. So now we define the address width as lowercase n, just the small n. So currently the small n is three, but you can see the circuit depth actually is eight. So you can see the exponential scaling of the address, uh, I'm sorry, of the circuit depths in terms of this address width n. So actually, uh, you can imagine that this is definitely not, not an ideal uh, architecture for either quantum algorithms or QMR because the latency is so high. You can imagine that if you have an address with um, where it's eight, let's say, you have to implement a circuit with uh, circuit depth two to the eight because it's ex exponential with the address width. So that's it. That's the name of sequential query circuit. It's very close to the classical RAM, but the good thing for it is, is it still can provide a superposition of all the possible addresses and the correspond data. Okay, questions. Okay, so latency actually means is the circuit depth here. So let's imagine we have to implement this oracle in your quantum algorithm. So it's like uh, you should query the RAM, uh, like the RAM access in the classical algorithms or in some classical applications. But if you want to uh, say access the quantum version of the RAM, but the RAM is uh, has so like deep depths here which means you have to take a long time to query the RAM, quantum version of the RAM. So definitely your efficiency of algorithm will be affected by this latency of this QRAM. So that's the latency meaning of latency here.
Sure. Uh, okay, so let's continue. So definitely we don't want a architecture like this because if you implement a quantum realm like this, every quantum algorithm is meaningless. Once you have to uh, fetch the data from the quantum realm, you have to wait for a very long time, which will destroy the quantum advantages we have. So we are trying to, let's say, think about if there is a clever way to implement a quantum oracle with more parallelism in it. So previously what we did is just sequentially fetch all of the addresses, but we are trying to think about a architecture with more parallelism. So the solution actually is called quantum router. This is the element for another implementation of the quantum oracle. So actually we already know the name of the uh, implementation of the quantum oracle but that's called QRAM or sometimes we call it router based QRAM. Now this quantum router is the fundamental element of the router based QRAM. So let's see how it works. Uh, the center circle in this quantum router correspond to a QRAM qubit. We just call it QRAM qubit or router qubit. And it depends on the, inf I'm sorry, it decides the information flow in this quantum router. So if the router qubit is set to be zero here, the input qubit B will be swapped to the left output. Similarly, if it's set to be one, then you have to swap the input with the right output. So actually this can be implemented with two controlled swap gate. But you always keep in mind that this is a qubit. So you are allowing a superposition of this router qubit. So it can be simultaneously in zero state and one state. So the input qubit are actually simultaneously swapped to the left output and the right output. Okay. So let's say if you have a lot of quantum routers, then combining a lot of quantum routers into a tree-like st structure can give you a bucket brigade quantum random access memory. So it's called bucket brigade QRAM. So uh, how to connect these routers? So let's say uh, the top one is the parent router. And the parent router has two outputs. So left output and the right output actually serves as the input of the children routers. So you can imagine it will forms like a tree structure. And finally, you will get a complete binary tree because each router has two outputs which means it should have two children. So look at the right example here. In this circuit, if you want to query 0, 1, 0, then the first step is you should swap this 0 into the first qubit. Then, uh, since the first qubit is set to be 0, you know that you should swap the second qubit, which is 1 here, to the left output of the uh, sort of first router because the first router central qubit is set to be zero. Similarly, the third zero qubit should be swapped to the right output of the second router. Um, sorry, Shifan, for interruption. Are you like pointing out something? Because like, I'm seeing you to point out at the blank spot. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I should use some anecdote here. Um, okay, I'm trying to use a spotlight. Oh, uh, no, I, I'm seeing your mouse. I didn't see any spotlight over here. Just like see your mouse, your mouse moving. Uh, sorry. Okay, I can use this pen. Uh, so let's uh, say we have this zero here, so everybody uh, can see this. No, I said mm -hmm. like, is it only me or 
uh, because I saw like your drawing is under the words like implement instead of the uh, figures B. Oh, I see. Got it. Um, I'm sorry. My bad. Uh, so let's let's just look at the pictures. Okay. Uh, yeah. I will no explain worries. it. Yeah. Right. No worries. Okay. Um, so let's see the zero one zero here. It corresponds to the classical base string two, in the binary representation. So by using this sort of spatial representation to indicate the location of this qubit, uh, we can figure out the x2 is actually the classical cell you want to sort of refer to. So here, this address qubit is swapped into this QRAM exactly at the position of this x2. So you can finally sort of reach the position of this classical data x2. Now we just show the case for a single address access. But definitely this address can be stored in the qubits with a superposition. So you can imagine all of these swaps actually can be in quantum states, which means you can be the superposition of all these configurations of different addresses and the corresponding memory cells. So look at how many steps, or in another word, the circuit depths of this case. Actually, it's three. Because you just need to swap the qubit into the tree according to the sort of position of the states in that central qubit. Now, it's exponentially smaller than the SQC case because now the circuit depth is linear with the address width 3 here. But a bad thing is you have to use exponential number of the qubits or quantum routers to influence this architecture. Look at this by complete binary tree. You have two to the n minus one. So let's say uh, lowercase n correspond to three, which means you have to use seven quantum routers in this architecture to implement a um, depth three linear depth query to the classical memory cells. So it's sort of a different version of the SQC with very different behaviors. Okay, after we see two different implementations of the quantum oracle, let's compare the advantages and different uh and limitations of the SQC and QRAM. Uh, so as we just introduced, we now do a recap here. Very obviously, the sequential query circuit SQC has exponential circuit depths and QRAM actually has linear circuit depths. But the number of qubits required by the SQC is linear, while the uh, qubits required by the QRAM is an exponential in terms of number of the address qubits, so the address width. So the natural question is, if I can combine these two architectures and provide some trade-offs between these two. So I can tell you that's possible. And the given solution is called virtual QRAM. Okay, so today we will go in, into this virtual QRAM and see uh, an end-to-end design of it. So the end-to-end -end design actually means we first try to improve the circuit level behavior of this QRAM, and then we go into the hardware level. So um, people may be very interested in like, how can a theorist uh, try to understand how the hardware works? So actually we made some assumptions and try to make these hardware as some uh, abstractions of the real hardware architecture. And we solve the graph theory problems or sort of like that. That's so-called hardware architecture. And finally, we will deal with a um, very fundamental problem in quantum computer, which is the noise. Okay, so let's first go into the virtual QRAM circuit architecture, and I will explain how this virtual QRAM works. 
So uh, definitely this virtual QRAN comes from the name of the classical domain, which is the virtual RAM. So I think you guys may be familiar with the virtual RAM in classical memory. So multiple smaller physical address spaces can be combined into a larger virtual address space. So now, for example, I have a I have two chips or two blocks. Each block has capacity four. So the capacity four correspond to the size of the QRAM. It's just the two to the n. So it's exponential with the um, address width of the RAM. Now you can combine two four qubit blocks into a larger virtual, sorry, I should say memory cells, classical memory cells, because currently we are talking about the classical RAM. And you can combine these two into a large virtual address space for the virtual RAM. So our virtual QRAM actually shares the very similar property that allows you to use a smaller QRAM to query a larger database. So look at the figure seven, right figure in the slides here. The first K qubits correspond to the SQC, so the sequential query circuit width, as we introduced before. And the remaining M qubits correspond to the QRAM part. So in this case, we have K equals one and QRAM with M equals two. So what's the meaning of this K and M? So the meaning of the K tells you how many blocks you have. So here K equals one. So you totally have two to the K equals two blocks. And the address, uh, the QRAM with M tells you how many memory cells in a single block. So currently M uh, equals two, which means you totally have four memory cells in a single block. And now we can show you, you just need to implement a QRAM, which can query just for a single block. You have the capacity or you have the sort of ability to query the entire space with multiple blocks. So let's see how we can do it. Look at the buffer qubit here. We have zero, A1 and A2. So the first qubit actually corresponds to the sequential query circuit qubit. Now we set it to be zero. Zero means we are activate the first block of the entire memory cells. So now the x0 to x3 is activated and your QRAM is querying this part. But then we can switch this sort of first qubit into one. Then you can imagine that the second part of this memory cells are activated and now we should use this QRAM to query the second part. So we're trying to use the first qubit as an indicator to activate some of the memory cells to be activated and using the QRAM, smaller QRAM, to query the entire space. So now our QRAM has only capacity four, but you are allowed to query a memory size eight. That's what we call virtual QRAM. So far so good, any questions? Yeah, it's, it's very, very clear. So um, so at least for me, I didn't have any question for now. Thanks a lot. Uh, so let's continue on the design of this circuit. The idea of hypothesizing the SQC and the QRAM actually is not new. Connor in 2021 has already proposed a hybrid circuit in this one, in this figure. So a QRAM, part can be naturally divided into three stages, which is address loading one, data retrieval one, and address loading one. So this three correspond to a single QRAM. But why we write like two uh, copies of the three stages here? That's because we are doing the virtual QRAM. 
we are trying to query the two blocks sequentially. So that's why we have address loading one, address loading one, and address loading two, data retrieval two, lot of like that. So the QRAM part, since we can naturally divide it into three stages, then we are very interested in the behavior of these three stages. And we can find that the first stage actually is exactly the same at the second, uh, I'm sorry, at the third stage. So they are actually al always doing the address loading. So the first stage load the QRAM address into the tree, as we mentioned in the QRAM part, it's like a tree and you have to load all these address into the tree. The data retrieval is sort of um, using some qubit to reveal the classical data stored in your classical memory. And finally, address loading one actually is a uncomputing of the first stage, which means you should um, swap those qubits out of the QRAM and make everything into its initial state. So we sequentially do this three stages and for each blocks, we also sequentially do the stages for each blocks. An interesting thing is, uh, look at the address loading one and address loading two here. Besides their control qubit, which is actually first controlled on the zero, but second controlled on the one, all of the modules in it, modules here means the circuits and the gates in this controlled gate is exactly the same for address loading one and two. So interesting question is, if it's possible, let's say, combine this two or just to cancel it, then we can save a lot. So actually we can. So the answer is in the bottom circuit. We can cancel the two address loading stages in the middle. But why this is important? Um, because if you recap the QRAM uh, implementation as a binary tree, we have to swap those qubits in the address loading into the tree. And the swaps use the C swap gate, controlled swap gate. This controlled swap gate actually is not Clifford gate. This non-Clifford gate will bring you a very large T gates overhead. So by canceling all of this address loading terms in the middle, you can sort of save a lot of T counts, T gate counts. Notice this data retrieval stage actually don't include any uh, sort of non clifford gates. It just use a lot of C nodes. So by doing so, by doing so, uh, previously you have to use exponential number of the address loadings in the middle stage. Uh, here exponential means exponential in terms of the parameter k. Now you can cancel everything in the middle, but just leave the address loading and address unloading at the very beginning and, and at the very end of the circuit. Uh, sorry, I want to clarify something. So for sure. the second block, right, the, the one below, uh, for the ad address loading block, so it's, it will no longer be a control unit trees or... No, because... uh, that's true. You know, uh, you, you no longer need to uh, sort of control doing this gate. Okay. You just need to load the address. That's enough. Hmm. Okay. It's like, uh, and it save some resources over here as well, right? Because uh, for control gates, then you have to kind of like make uh, decompositions and then you'll be having more gates in order to um, implement the control operations. So that's true. Yeah. That's exactly true. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And I think more savings actually comes from the canceled like middle stages. That's very important. Um, I can give you a relatively um, more clear uh, sort of um, description for how much resource we saved from this optimization. So we have two uh, sort of competitors 
The first is called BBQRAM from Corner Hang 2021. Another one is a little bit older, comes from Guang Hao Lo in 2018. And our virtual QRAM does at least as good as one of them. So it's like we take the advantage from both of them. We can say, uh, we can see we achieved the quadratic improvement in the circuit depths in terms of this parameter M uh, for this swap-based QRAM, where we achieve a exponential number of the improvement of the T count and the T depths comparing to the bucket brigade QRAM introduced by Connor in 2021. So similarly, for the quadratic improvement of the Clifford depths for the swap-based QRAM. So this is a circuit level design, which figure out some redundant parts in the circuit. By canceling them, you can save a lot of gates. So that's the basic idea for the first part. Then let's look at a, I think should be more interesting topic for the mapping strategy of the QRAM. So I think people uh, here may mostly interested in the algorithm level design or performance of the sort of quantum tasks, but uh, seldom we comes into the lower level, like hardware level implementations of these algorithms and machines. But we can see actually, we can use a high level to understand the machine. So first, uh, let me introduce the current routing strategy in superconducting quantum compu uh, computer. So what is so-called routing strategy? So for example, you have two qubits in your quantum machine and you want to implement some, uh, let's say, C0 gate. In circuit level, actually, we always imagine that every qubit, uh, every qubit is sort of connected. So all the qubits are all to all connected. But actually, that's not the case in real hardware. For example, in superconducting, uh, we usually have a 2D topology, which means the qubit is not all to call connected, but can only interact with its nearest neighbors. So let's say this A and B forms a chain, 1D chain, uh, in the quantum machine. So if A and B has distance D, to implement a two qubit gate, you have to swap this A very close to B in the current machine. So this is the commonly used strategy in, strategy in the current quantum computer, which means you have to swap D times and make A and B close to each other, then you can implement some C not gate. Uh, you can imagine this is not a good strategy, definitely, and it's very consuming, not only for the sort of so many swap gates, but also the latency. Again, we have used the sort of word of latency because this is just a part of the circuit. When you're doing the swaps, other parts of the circuit are waiting. When they are waiting, they are suffering from decoherence errors. So you definitely don't want this sort of to happen. So we want to implement a faster routing strategy, which is called teleportation-based routing. Teleportation-based routing use a strategy called entanglement swapping. It first generates EPR pairs between qubits, uh, between qubits A and qubits B in the qubits between them. So notice a very important thing here is Qubits between A and B have to be available and they don't carry any logical information. So the key, of this key observation is any qubits in the mapping which don't serve as QRAM or data qubits, which means they don't carry any logical information, they are available to use. You can freely use them, can be used to accelerate the swap operation or swap routing by teleportation. So let's see how it works. 
you can generate EPI pairs for those qubits and then apply this bell state measurements. So notice this EPI generation and bell state measurements can be done in parallel. So they are not sequentially done one by one, and you can always do this in parallel. So no matter how sort of uh, much distance A and B have, you can always implement this in constant steps. So look at the circuit. If you have a swap circuit, you have to swap uh, the qubits one by one, which gives you a sort of circuit depth D. But for this tabulation based circuit, you just need to implement constant time uh, or constant depth circuit that's enough to teleport this qubit A very close to B, then you can um, implement two qubit gates. That's a very fundamental problem in the sort of hardware or mapping problem that we are trying to in, uh, understand in the circuit level or in the graph level. That's great. Okay. So we already know a very efficient routing strategy, but only though the routing strategy cannot ensure us any improvements from the previous scheme. The reason is this assumption is very restricted. You have to ask A and B uh, and ask the qubits between them are available. That's not the common case in quantum computer because these qubits may also carry some logical information. So you can not destroy them and generate EPI pairs as you like. So we have to combine it with a mapping strategy. Then we can achieve this sort of acceleration from the previous scheme. So now let's assume our quantum computer, the NISC quantum computer uh, has a 2D grid topology, which means each qubit has four neighbors and it's like a grid. So look at the figure A here. Uh, we have nine qubits and it forms a, these qubits form a grid. And from the VLSI design, the classical domain, we can embed this QRAM tree structure into this grid. And the better thing is you can even recursively doing this. You can use a small component as a subcomponent component of a larger QRAM. So you can combine four small QRAMs into a larger QRAM recursively using this edge tree embedding. So people may ask, what's the meaning of this or why, why we have to implement this? So look at the right figure here. We show a capacity 16 case of the QRAM. If you don't care about the embedding or uh, like routing strategy of the QRAM, when you try to influence the QRAM into the hardware, you may suffering from a lot of sort of overhead from the real hardware because the qubits are actually not auto connected. You have to waste a lot of qubits. I'm sorry, you have to waste a lot of sort of swap operations, like swap overhead, which will makes your QRAM latency to be very large. But now we use this green dots to influence the teleportation. So look at this green dots. It's only circuit, uh, constant circuit over circuit depth overhead for this green dots. So actually, if you implement a QRAM like this, you can always achieve the logarithmic behavior of this capacity, which means linear with the uh, address width. So if you still remember the uh, tree-liked QRAM, we just call it tree-liked. The tree-like QRAM has the circuit depth linear with the address width. 
now you have this linear teleportation. Combine them two together, they are still linear. So asymptotic asymptotically, this embedding and this um, routing strategy can ensure you a latency optimal QRAM, which means you, even you have a NISC machine which don't have the property of this all to all connected qubits hardware, you can still influence this QRAM with very low latency and very efficiently. So that's why I think the QRAM architecture design is very useful for the data processing because you have to implement a RAM with very low latency to ensure you can implement such uh, classical data processing efficiently. Okay. And uh, more importantly, if you stick on the current swap-based routing in the current machine, you will suffer from a exponential uh, extra operation depth which means you will destroy the advantage of this QRAM from the classical ones. So you have to use this teleportation-based routing to keep your QRAM still faster than the classical RAM. I mean, exponentially faster. Okay, so final part, we will briefly introduce the noise robust QRAM because this is sort of a fundamental problem in the NISC quantum architecture or quantum hardware. We have to deal with the quantum noise. So a good thing for the RAM, QRAM, is actually its intrinsic noise resilience. This noise resilience means um, even you have some quantum errors in the QRAM, it still works well. So why it's the case? Because the errors in the QRAM are constrained in some part of the QRAM. They don't propagate across the architecture or across the circuits. That's called noise resilience. Like the error propagation in the circuit is highly limited. So you can, even you have some errors in the local area of this circuit, you can still ensure other part of the circuit is still good and perfect to use. And why this happens? So let's first recall us some commutator relationships for Z and C0 gates. So if you have some Z errors before the C0 gate, it equals to a C0 gate following by the same Z errors. So Z error is transparent to the C0 gate when it is in the control qubit of the C0 gate. However, uh, if the Z errors happens before the C0 gate, but in the target qubit of the C0 gate, then it will propagate into two Z errors here. So that's bad. We definitely see don't want to see the second case. So very fortunately, the QRAM circuit looks like in figure C here. All of the qubits are arranged in this tree, and all of the gates are controlled and targeted uh, from the bottom qubits to the top. So let's say we have a Z error here in this qubit. Very interesting thing is it will not propagate to the top qubit due to the commutator relationship in the A because it's, uh, it happens in the control qubit of the first C0 gate. However, it does propagate into the children qubits here due to the uh, commutator relationship B here. But a good thing is you have a Z error somewhere in this tree. You will only destroy the subtree of the entire tree. So whenever Z error happens, the subtree is destroyed, but other part is still good. So we can see this uh, noisy resilience of QRAM is biased for Z error, because if you have a X error by the commutator relationship, it will goes up and destroy everything. 
So by some theoretical scaling and some theoretical analysis, uh, we can achieve for a single QRAM, which doesn't include any SQC part, has a lower bound on the error rate or the query fidelity, which means um, you can, for a smaller QRAM, for a small scale QRAM, and for a relatively lower error rate axiom here, you can have your QRAM fidelity, which is bounded by this one minus eight axiom M square. <laughs> and for virtual QRAM in our version, we can also derive the same, uh, not the same, but very similar lower bound for this too, for both Z and X errors. But notice this X errors actually is exponentially large with the Z errors. So the bound for the virtual X is much lower bound. Um, actually, it's much lower than the virtual Z. So if you look at the simulation here, the first row three figures correspond to the Z errors. And for the uh, lower three correspond to the X errors. And you can see the Z errors behaves much better than X. So the green parts means the QRAM works well. Okay, so finally, let's come to some evaluation. Uh, we, we use a uh, novel Feynman pass simulator to simulate the virtual QRAM because it's too large and cannot be simulated by some normal, normal simulators like Cascade simulator or like uh, something like that. And we can see significant difference of the fidelity of Z errors and X error channels. A very interesting point is um, we introduced the error reduction factor X on R here, which donates, uh, which denotes the ratio of the error rate from the current mission and the expected future mission. So let's say the error reduction factor is 10, which means uh, in this mission, it's 10 times better than the current mission. So by comparing these two figures, we confirm that our QRAM is biased noise resilient. And I think a more realistic problem to ask is if QRAM is already viable on the current QPUs. So very sadly, the answer is no. We did some simulations directly from the current Q, uh, quantum hardware, some small scale QRAMs uh, from IBM's machine. And we catch the realistic error model from the IBM quantum computer and apply our sort of error reduction factor to see if uh, what, like what types of improvements are needed so that we can make small scale QRAM practical to use. Though the answer is currently we cannot have a QRAM, but the answer is not as bad as people usually think. So we see a very significant improvement when the error rate is just 10 times better than the current machine. So maybe in the near future, uh, maybe in the near future, we have 10 times better machine. So 10 time, times better means the gate error rate are 10 times better than the current machine. Uh, the uh, qubit decoherence time is 10 times longer than the current machine like this. Uh, so if we have 10 times better machine, then we can achieve small scale practical QRAM. Since we just need a small scale QRAM, we can use the virtual QRAM to query a larger database. So that's actually very promising already. So finally, the conclusion is virtual QRAM architecture can improve the memory capacity and the resource overhead. And we have a hardware design of the teleportation-based routing and mapping strategy. And we also analyzed for some intrinsic biased noise resilience property for the QRAM. And finally, we achieved a claim that we still need some key technology advanced like gate error rate reduction or implementing some error correction codes. Then we can achieve some uh, realistic or some practical small scale QRAM. 
bad. It's not so bad. Uh, it's still very promising and very close to us. So I think that's all for uh, today. I want to talk. Thanks a lot for listening and feel free to ask questions. Yeah, um, thanks uh, very much, Chifan, for the very interesting talk. And I really like the way they present uh, like the QRAMs and how, uh, what type of QRAM do we have and then mm -hmm. how, 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 how should we like, solve the issues and what kind of issues. And uh, the animation is definitely uh, help in understanding how the information flows and then it's really like, facilitated the understanding. Um, so for the audience, if you have any questions, then you can like, unmute yourself to ask the questions. Uh, yeah, let me start by asking um questions. Uh while they are thinking about the question to ask. Um so far I've saw uh all those like uh address qubits, right? You are preparing them in like super like uniform superposition state. Um do you mm -hmm. think it's helpful to kind of prepare some like uh, non uniform like uh super, uh non uniform like superposition state for the uh, for the ancillary qubits? Uh, sorry, address qubits. Uh, so actually, the address sort of address preparation stage is prior to this quantum oracle because mm -hmm. you can use this quantum oracle in the middle stage of your quantum algorithm, like the Grover's algorithm, some oracle UF in the middle. It doesn't depend on the coefficients before the address. So no matter it's a uniform addresses or it's a non-uniform linear combination of different addresses, this QRM works. Uh, well, for both cases, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think the currently we already have some non-unitary cases for this uh QRAM to process. For example, the middle stage of the uh Grover's algorithm, you already searched to some middle point the address like coefficients before the addresses is already different. But you still use this QRAM like Grover's article to um, implement Grover's function, so it works, right? Right. And um, so like how hard it is to prepare a specific like uniform uniform like state of uh specific addresses because like if for example we want to have a uniform supervision of across like all the like uh computation spaces then we apply all the Hanama gates, right? Then right. um uh for the object state then we know how to prepare. But like for like is it hard to prepare arbitrary kind of like uniform state for a given given set of computational bases? Right. Uh so we have decided that uh I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that, but some errors has already uh, figure it out that arbitrary state preparation is hard. Hard mm -hmm. here means you have to use exponential circuit depths to implement that state preparation procedure. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so okay. Generally, so even say, even for uniform like position states, consider under that category, and that's why, um, it's hard. Uh no, I mean the worst case. So uh, I see. Mm -hmm. Right. So uniform definitely is a easier case. Right. Okay, um, and uh, so now it's like nine five eight. Uh, okay, maybe I can ask last one last questions uh before uh, ending the seminars and over here like I think it's like people have increasingly aware that different architecture will be suitable for different purposes. Um, for example, Iron Q will be for like maybe quantum memory. I'm not sure. Um and then for superconducting qubits, maybe it's for processing because they could like kind of like process and implement the gates very fast. Do you like do you think that there's a specific architecture that is tailored to implement QRAMs, for example? Um and then yeah. Just, That's just great to question. Ask, yeah, ask a general opinions on this. Yeah, thanks for pointing out. That's a great question, actually. Um we have seen a lot of types of implementations of QRAM in different hardwares, but no one seems currently works well. Um, so I think the uh, definitely superconducting is very promising. But uh, recently I see a new paper. I saw a new paper. Uh, I think it's from National Lab uh, America. I forgot which national lab, but it's called Heitogenius 
quantum architecture, which means that combines different um, platforms and make them uh, to serve as different functions. For example, superconducting runs faster, so they can use as computing units, but the trapped ion, uh, they have longer uh, coherence time, so you can use them as sort of storage qubits. So I think this types of uh, heterogeneous architecture may be more suitable for the implementation of QRAM and maybe even more suitable for arbitrary uh, quantum algorithms. Right, okay. Yeah, I will check it out uh, because I didn't aware of this this paper. Uh, I think it will definitely be a fun read to kind of like see how people trying to connect different architecture together and uh, treat it as, like use it for different functionalities. Um, right. Yeah, I think uh, maybe okay. Maybe we can like uh, end the seminar now because it will be quite late. Uh, on your side, and thank you very much for uh the amazing like uh talk that you gave, and now I have a better understanding of the at least the landscape for like QRAM and the different type of QRAMs and how we even like potentially make use of a virtual QRAMs in the futures like for our like futures quantum algorithms. Um, yeah, my pleasure. Thanks a lot for inviting me, and I'm very, very glad today to have a talk here. Yeah. So honored to do that. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Then uh, probably we can like uh, end the seminar. Thanks for thanks everyone for attending the seminars, and see you next week. Thanks everyone.